managing editor and uh, head honcho of flamesnation.ca, Ryan Pike. Pike, I know you were watching uh, the Frank hit with uh, great interest there. There's a ton going on. Let's break this down and put it into the Calgary lens of what Keg Craig Conroy has accomplished to this point, what the next 48, 72 hours look like, and then what you expect to see Monday in free agency. Well, I mean, you know, Craig's probably like a kid in a candy store. I mean, the, the, the club has been dealing with the flat cap as everyone else has been pretty much since like 2019. And this year it's jumping to 88 million and it coincides with the flames getting a lot of fairly big contracts off their books. And as a result, you know, as we sit right now, if you look at the the guys who are basically shoe ins for the initial roster, he's got 24 million bucks to work with. And what are the big pieces for him to get done? He has to negotiate some kind of a contract with Dustin Wolf. And I can't imagine Wolf will be terribly expensive considering he's played 18 games in the NHL. So that's probably not terribly expensive. And then you got to hash something out with Oliver Shillington. And then you basically have at that point, probably what, 19, 20 million, something that Jeez. range to work I, with. So, yeah, I would think so. They're what, 23 and change right now. They've got almost a full roster. You put Shillington in there. I feel like that's probably the group of defensemen you move forward with. Maybe there's room for another four, but they are swimming in cap space, Pike. Yeah, and I think that's it gives them the ability to do a lot of different things. They could be a broker. I mean, we just, you know, we saw, you know, the we just saw San Jose get a pretty decent defenseman in Jake Wallman and get a second round pick for their troubles because Detroit has other things they want to do with their cap space. So I think there's gonna be a lot of teams out there that look at a team like Calgary as a potential fit for something like that. Maybe maybe even not now. Maybe it's something that they, they deal with at the trade deadline because, you know, if you look at the crystal ball, uh, you, you guys have been talking about it on the show for a while. Uh, you know, Sharon Govich, Mangiapani, and Kuzmenko, all on expiring deals. I don't know if they're all going to be here long term. So you're looking at potentially at least one of those guys being moved by or before the trade deadline. So there's a lot of different things that Conroy could do. And I think, you know, we we've talked about you know the challenges of for lack of a better term shoveling out the barn after a contention window closes and you know craig has basically had uh, a lot of messes to clean up since he got into the big chair and i think now you could look, take a look at what they have and go okay there's a lot of flexibility here that they didn't have before and especially going into this weekend you got nine draft picks you got six first round picks in the next three drafts and you have a lot of ability to do things you probably could not have done in a different situation. So I'll frame this two ways. On one hand, I would not have put any money down that Oliver Shillington and the Calgary Flames would be six days away from free agency and no deal would be in place. And then on the other hand, chatting with Craig last week, which is up on our YouTube page and we tacked on to the end of Monday's show, it just feels like this is a matter of terms and not if Oliver Shillington is still expected to get signed, but boy, Ryan, this is taking way more time than we thought it was going to take. I'll say this. What is Oliver Shillington? And I, I mean, no disrespect to the player, but for a guy that's basically missed two, almost two years of professional hockey. And he, he looked really good when he came in in January. And I think reason we can reasonably surmise that that's, you know, him joining the season in a less than ideal circumstance mid season without a full training camp with us. So that's probably the, that's probably the floor for Oliver Shillington. The floor for sure. Oliver Shillington is he's a pretty good third pairing defenseman, maybe, maybe a decent second pairing guy, but what do you pay him when he hasn't played in a while? And you're trying to figure out how to project him and you're trying to figure out how he fits in to the long term. because if you're the Calgary flames, you don't really necessarily want to be signing Oliver Shillington and then doing this dance again. You would love to lock him in at a number, but it's got to be a number that makes sense. But, you know, talking to folks around the team and around the league, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't frame anything as contentious. The, the flames have a, a lot of admiration for him as a person and as a player. And I think that showed through the last, two, three years in terms of how they've gone about handling a situation. And I would say that that feeling is mutual. I think there's a lot of respect from Shillington's camp in terms of the flames could would, would have been well within the rights to be more open with what was going on with him, but they wanted to respect the player's privacy. And I think that goes a long way, not just with Shillington, but with players around the league that might be considering the Calgary flames. But again, you know, he's, he's a unicorn. He's, you know, 20, 27 turning 28. He doesn't have a lot of miles on him because of the, the, 
minutes that he he or the the years that he missed. So he could potentially still have upside that they haven't touched yet. But it's just a question of how do you project that? Yeah, I agree. I I loved him with Chris Tana, but all of a sudden you're talking that was year one of Daryl Sutter, his first full season. That's a while ago. And I didn't love him with Rasmus Anderson in the role they were put in last year, but it was also a tougher year for Rasmus. And I don't know that he's going to be on a defensive matchup pair. If you told me Chris Tana was there, I'd say, oh, he's a second pair defenseman, Ryan. But (laughs) given what he's got to work with on his – right side I, i'm not so sure what he is and i think that's probably why it's hard to price because if he's just hard and fast a second pair guy you know what that's worth and well if he's just a five and we can use him on our second power play unit well you kind of got a, an idea a ballpark of what that's worth i think that's probably the gap we're in isn't it yeah and you know looking at from the the his his cast perspective if if you're coming to me and say hey i know you've gone through like an absolute shit show in your life the last two years you're probably looking for some stability one to a one-year deal that that probably doesn't really resonate. So I think if I'm him, I'm probably looking for a longer term deal. If I'm the flames, I'm probably looking for a longer term deal too at the right number. And I think, you know, you want to make sure that you're allowing yourself some flexibility. And I, I think the fact, I think the fact that the flames have as much cap space as they do helps because they have the ability to roll the dice on him. But I think also, I think, listening to what Craig was telling you guys in, in conversations I've had with Craig over the last year, I don't think they, they're, you, if you behave as if you're a kid in a candy store with your cap space, pretty soon you're going to not going to have any cap space. So I think they're operating, you know, the, the, the analytics department, the, the, the stats department that Chris Snow built is really dialed into basically everything the club does. I think they have trade value projections for every single player in the organization. And I think they have cap, projections for every single player in the organization and i think even if you have 24 million dollars in cap space you have to act as if you have basically none and operate like that because you know if you blow all the cap space in july guess what you don't have it in march and i think that's the mindset they're operating with yeah i i certainly think they might try to add some pieces but there's no way i envision them heading into the season uh with, with anything but tons of cap space to still have that flexibility that you spoke of that has been so um, I guess rare in the last uh, decade for the club. Uh, okay, so Friday they have pick number nine. They have pick number 28. That's right now. They also have six other picks in the first four rounds, two in the first, two in the second, two in the fourth, not to mention two firsts next year, two firsts in 2026, even after surrendering one to Montreal in 2025. Uh, what are your expectations for Conroy Friday night is second full draft as general manager of the flames. It certainly isn't. I'm ready for all kinds of surprises and plot twists. And this guy's not supposed to slide this far. I can't believe this guy's available. I mean, I I think it's going to be wild Friday night. Yep. And, you know, hearing Frank's, you know, throw throw out the idea that the flames might entertain trading up. I wouldn't rule anything out with the flames with the way this first round looks, you know, if a player falls to you that you love, that looks like he's sliding, they have the ability to stand pat and get a good player. And, you know, the way even just the way this first round is set up, there's about a dozen to 15 guys sort of in that top ledge. And then there is a drop off and then a bit more of a drop off after about 2021. And so if you're the Flames, you know, you're thinking, man, you could slide back and gain a pick and still get somebody like maybe you use that 28th pick and something else to move up into that above the 21 ledge and then get somebody in sort of that second ledge. Maybe you can move up to a little bit higher. Uh, and like I said, they, they have those UFAs potentially, you know, we, we, I think uh, Andrew Mangiapane was on Frank's trade board. So yeah. I don't, you know, I'd be, I'm going into this weekend going, I don't really know what to expect. And that kind of excites me because I think they have a lot of things they'd feel comfortable doing if the price is right. The other thing they have is they have a need everywhere. I mean, I think goalie is <laughs> the only spot I don't expect them to, to make some serious waves, Pike. And I mean, they like Wolf. They've got to give him some time to, to see what he is. Uh, it's also not a great draft for goalies. You might not see one in the first three rounds. Um, but you have great need to find top four defensemen, top pair guys. You have no real dynamic game-changing winger yet. Maybe Coronado is one, and you certainly don't have a young franchise center. It's a really nice spot to be in at nine because whatever slides is going to be something you need, whether that's a winger, a centerman, or a defenseman. Yeah, I think you know th- this is the, the type of draft where I don't know if there's sort of a lot of truly elite or 
quasi elite level guys outside of the first two or three, but there's a lot of good players that are going to be available. Like, I mean, just looking at the, the various mock drafts, uh, there's guys that will be available at nine that some guys, some teams, some draft rankers will have in the top five or top six. Like there's going to be a lot of chaos. And, you know, even at 28, I mean, the, the flames are probably going to get somebody they really like at 28. Uh, there's, you know, we, we just posted our, uh, our annual aggregate rankings at the, at the site. And there's probably, I'd say, I don't know, 40, close to 30, close to 40 players that have gotten first round consideration by multiple major draft rankers, which means wow. if you're the flame sitting at 41, you're going to get somebody that, uh, that you or someone smart, that's not you thinks is a first round caliber talent. And you know, that's, that's the, 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 a, the beauty of this year's draft and b the beauty of having so many picks, you're going to be able to go further down and, you know, you're, you're probably pretty happy with guys that you pick, you know, well into the third and fourth rounds. We're going to hear, we'll have, we'll, we're sitting there on Saturday. We'll have heard of some of these guys taking the third and fourth rounds because that's how deep this draft class is in sort of the, the, the second and third levels. Do you have a, a a dream boat of a guy for the Flames out there? Is there one? I mean, the obvious off the ace storyline is TJ Ginla, but he's certainly not the only dynamic player that could be available to him at nine. Uh, is there one where you're like, oh boy, that certainly would really help turn around this transition from rebuild into competitive play? One of those defensemen. I, I know. I know the. I think. I think Stephen Ellis put it really well in his draft rankings, calling Sam Dickinson uh, from London the quote unquote safe pick. But Sam Dickinson, like he, Sam Dickinson is just gr really good at everything. And if you're a Flames club that has a lot of the, uh, some stay at home guys in your system and some really high end offensive guys that might need someone to watch their back a bit defensively, Dickinson can play with anybody because he's really well rounded. Uh, you know, so I think if you can, if you're the Flames, you know, you're not going to get Levshin off. You're not going to get, you know, Demidov. I, I don't, I, I have, I'm nervous about Siliev just because I don't know where, what his offensive ceiling is. Right. But, you know, if you can get, Zane Parekh, if you can get, you know, Zeev uh, Boom, if you can get Sam Dickinson, one of those three guys, if, you know, fa failing, you know, Tija Ginla landing somewhere else, if you get one of those three defensemen, you're probably going to leave that first round going, okay, we, we, we filled a need pretty well. Yeah, I'm with you. And uh, it's funny because uh, we, we had Stephen Ellis on our mock draft that ran this morning, and it was Sam Dickinson that went to the Flames at number nine. And he also said he w it w is considered a safe pick, as you noted, but he said Evan Bouchard was considered that safe pick too. And then all of a sudden it took time, but when everything clicked, there's a hell of a ceiling there. Like for all the success Sam Dickinson's had, people don't think he's a dynamic thinker of the game yet. And that really only speaks to that this might be an incredibly high ceiling selection for the Flames if he's available. Yeah, and I'll I'll point out one more guy. Uh, we talked about uh, Tisha Ginla being potentially a fantastic story. Uh, Michael Hage from uh, the Chicago Steel. Yeah. Uh, he's a center. Uh, same same system that produced uh, uh, Matt Coronado. Uh, he's one of those guys that he he'll he's looking like he'll go somewhere in the late teens, like 18, 19, 20. I've seen some some lists have him, you know, just after the Flames pick. Uh, yeah. But you know, if if you're the Flames and maybe you don't get the guy you really love. Maybe you look at a trade back scenario and see if you can slide back a couple picks, gain a, a second or third rounder, and get Michael Hage because you know big center, dynamic, great personal story. He's you know he's dealt with a lot of adversity off the ice uh, between injuries and some family tragedies, but he's you know he got the character box ticked, he got the dynamic play ticked, he plays a position of need, and he's from a, a, a USHL's team and it's the Steel that you know outside of the maybe the London Knights is probably the best producer of NHL-ready talent in North America. Jeez. Interesting. I uh, can't wait for you to get down here and cover it in uh, greater length, Pike. One final one for you. What do you expect July 1? Are we going to see some significant dollars uh, on a guy for the Flames that might stabilize an area of the roster? Are we going to see that quad A around the edges work? Or are we going to see Craig Connor? I put the phone on mute and just smile ear to ear and wait for GMs to call to get them to help them out of pickles. I think a little of everything. I, I think you're probably looking to see if you can, you know, add some center help. Uh, you know, you I like I like Connor Zari at center, and I think long term he might be that. But you probably want to have someone to insulate him a bit potentially, and someone to mentor him a bit potentially. Uh, I think you know I I don't know if they're going to add much in the wings at the NHL level, but maybe some guys like if you look at the the depth charts, 
you know, they're probably losing Ben Jones uh, from the Wranglers to free agency. They probably want to grab some center depth there. Uh, you know, they have some young guys in their system they want to give some reps to, but I think they also want to provide some uh, some insulation. And, you know, at the, at the AHL level, I mean, you know, you look at the NHL, their goalies are a guy who's played 18 NHL games and a guy with a bad hip who just came mm-hmm. off major surgery. So you probably want to go out and spend some money on getting a third guy to insulate Volteri, Ignat you a bit and give him a bit of runway. And so, you know, if you're the Flames, I don't think you necessarily need to, you know, burn through your cap space. But I could see them, you know, dropping a good eight to ten million bucks here and there just to sort of fill positions of need. And I think they also have the ability to help other teams get creative. I think yeah. they could be a banker and, you know, they're they've done a lot of a lot of very nice work with the last little while creating that flexibility. And it's going to be very interesting to see when they exploit it. Great stuff, Pike. Do appreciate it. Uh, when do you get down here and uh, how much, uh, I guess, uh, suntan lotion can you bring? I, I, I'm hiding in the shade, but at some point I will have to face the sun. I need help. I need your help. Oh, I'm uh, I'm going to die out there. It's uh, I, I'm always struck at the humidity and it's like, sit, you know, it's like sitting in a convection oven. But yes, yeah, I, no I, uh, I'm supposed to land at, uh, I think, 10 a.m. on Thursday. And I uh, much like uh, Frank's strategy to avoid getting sucked into the pinder vortex is, is being at a completely different hotel. I, uh, <laughs> I insulate myself a little bit more. I put an international border between us for a few days and then I go down. So the, I think the, between how busy we'll be with, uh, the draft and all the other stuff we got going on, I think the, your ability to destroy my life and liver diminished, not negated completely, but a little bit diminished. It's about mitigating risk. That's what it is, Pike. And I, I appreciate you doing that. Thanks so much for joining us here. And I uh, can't wait to get you down here. It is like walking into an oven. Like Jack, if you if you ever like, oh, like the uh, the appetizer, like the potatoes are done. Okay, but I'm not done on the barbecue. Okay, just put the oven on low and leave the potatoes in. Like that's all of Vegas. You walk out and it's like, whoo! You know when you open the oven door, there's just that that air wafts over you. That's the whole bleeping desert. Feels like that. Uh, it is sweating in the shade. So Pike, we'll see you soon. Thanks for popping on. I appreciate it. See you tomorrow, buddy. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out more of our content right here on the Flames Nation YouTube page. We had a bunch of great long-form interviews. You can check out some videos we've done as well outside of the studio. And, of course, if you want more writing or merchandise stuff, flamesnation.ca or nationgear.ca. Appreciate you watching.